You're listening to Live from Lord North Street, a podcast from the Institute of Economic Affairs. Britain takes a uniquely restrictive approach to occupational licensing. Around one in five UK employees requires a license from government to practice their chosen occupation, a proportion which has doubled in the last 15 years. Joining me today is Professor Len Shackleton, the IA's editorial fellow and author of a recent report into occupational licensing. He examines whether the government's approach is necessary or desirable, particularly in a world of technological change with algorithms, robotics and artificial intelligence increasingly able to perform some of the functions of the established professions. He also takes a look at the wider state of employment and education in the UK and assesses how Britain's approach compares with other countries around the world. If you like what you hear, subscribe to our iTunes channel, IEA Conversations. First of all, can you briefly explain what occupational licensing is and give examples of the kind of sectors and professions that require this type of licensing? By occupational licensing, we mean that in order to to practice a job or a profession, you have to have some government approval for it in one form or another. And this approval may be given through the government directly, through quangos, through professional bodies or whatever. But the point is that you can't work without a licence of this kind. Now, this is obvious in cases, well-known cases like doctors and lawyers and so forth. But I think what is not known is that this applies to a very large number of, of occupations now. It's been growing very rapidly in the last 20 years or so. And uh, it includes many areas where you might not think that it ought to be controlled in this way, like social work, for example, like childminding, things like this. So... You say that governments are basically becoming more and more involved in setting occupational standards, which in their turn may limit people's entry into these professions. Is it justified? Well, I think uh, as an economist, I'd look at it in terms of what are the the, the market failures which licensing is supposed to uh, mitigate. One argument which is put forward is that of asymmetric information. That is to say that people using the, the, the skills of doctors, lawyers or whatever it may be, don't know as much as the people who are giving them the advice or providing the service. And this obviously presents certain problems. How do you know whether the service you're getting is any good? This kind of thing. One way to do this is for the government to license practitioners in this area to show that they meet some kind of standard which the government has approved. Asymmetric information is one argument, but against this, you, you have to point out that nowadays information is very much more widely available than what than it was in the past. And via the internet, for example, people can interrogate their symptoms before they go and see a doctor. They can look up the legal position when if they want to to get legal advice and so forth. So they've got much more access to this information than they had in the past. Moreover, there are now systems of rating people like, for example, Uber drivers and things like this, that's spreading to areas like lecturers and, and, and all sorts of occupations, where, where people can directly rate the service they've had rather than relying on this sort of second-hand government information. How does Britain compare with other countries in Europe? Are we uniquely over-regulating in some of these areas? Well, it's, it's interesting to look at the, the, the data. We're about 19 or 20 percent of uh, our workforce are, are now licensed in one way or another by the government. And this is uh, roughly around the same uh, as, as it is across Europe. However, if you look at the different professions which are, are regulated, it's a very different picture. Uh, we have uh, over 130 occupations which are now, according to the European Commission, which, which are now regulated, whereas countries like France, Germany, Italy, Spain have much lower numbers of occupations. Now, this is something to do with the occupational structure of the, of the UK compared with other countries. But nevertheless, uh, if you look at it, you can find occupations which exist in other countries, which are regulated in the UK, but are not regulated anywhere else in Europe. One example I I came across is farriers, who are people who put uh, horseshoes on horses, which requires a four-year training in the UK, requires uh, an apprenticeship, and yet this isn't regulated anywhere else in Europe. Why not? What's unique about British horses that needs them to be, you know, protected by the government? And anybody who puts a horseshoe on without possessing uh, an occupational license is subject to a fine of five thousand pounds. Why? 
Uh, how did we get here? Um, how, why is Britain regulating horseshoes in a way that other countries <laughs> in Europe aren't? Is it just kind of historical fluke? Well, I was speaking before of, of the sort of arguments which you can put forward for government intervention, market failures of one kind or another. But of course, there is a long tradition in economics of s- seeing these things often being driven by the occupation themselves. In other words, an occupation will seek government recognition, government licensing as a way of keeping out competition. And indeed, this was, this was an argument which was first discussed by Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations, where he talks about occupations organising themselves as as a kind of conspiracy against the public. Yeah, which Uh, is the the title of your uh, report. (laughs) Uh, and in more recent times, Milton Friedman was a trenchant critic of occupation licensing in the United States. In fact, his PhD was on occupational licensing. So it was a, a subject to which he returned many times during his career. So the, the vested interests um, are creating, as Adam Smith puts it, the, a conspiracy against the public. That really does imply a very deliberate act of economic sabotage. Governments get things wrong all the time. Why, in this case, does it look as though something more suspect is going on here rather than just government failure? Well, I think in, in recent years in particular, government has been very reactive to, to problems which inevitably emerge in large and complex societies. So, for example, the regulation of social work. Nowadays, to become a social worker, you have to have a degree qualification and a period of probation. If you want to retrain, you have to do a master's degree in, in social work uh, and so forth. So it's now much more difficult to get into them. This is a reaction, I think, to a series of social work issues. You know, these, some of these terrible tragedies with children and, and, and so forth, which we're all familiar with. But whether this is the solution to problems like that, which in my view are much more to do with the management of social work rather than what are the qualifications for social work. Uh, I think that's a a, a different issue. Can you give me a few other examples? I understand that in the police force there's been a new um, college of policing set up recently. Is this another example of the kind of thing that you're talking about? Well, the College of Policing is, a, is an interesting development. And of course, they're now t- uh, attempting to turn policing into an all-graduate profession. It's not entirely clear to me why this is a, a particularly useful thing to do, but clearly it will exclude large numbers of people who might traditionally have gone into, in, into the police force. I mean, one of the things which I've, I, I've tried to point out in this paper is that anything which raises barriers to entry into a profession will necessarily create problems with the diversity of people People going into it. I rather smile when I see lawyers saying, oh, it's very important that we have a higher proportion of people from ethnic minority backgrounds or higher proportion of women or whatever it may be. But the, the way in which uh, licensing is set up for the legal profession raises barriers to people from non-traditional backgrounds, to people who haven't got a lot of money to, to put into their training process and, and, you know, eating dinners in the inns of court and all that kind of palaver, yeah. which is a way of keeping people out, essentially. It also raises costs to the consumer. I was just reading it in the paper today of, of somebody who has been uh, acquitted of a very serious sexual offence uh, because the prosecution service have messed things up, essentially. This person's already spent £100,000 and hasn't actually appeared in court yet. Now, that makes it very difficult for people to get access to justice. And clearly, we can't have legal aid on the scale that would cover things like that. But what we might move towards, I hope, is a a profession which is deregulated, which allows much more competition, allows more people to go into it and brings down the price of justice, essentially. One of the things I, I, I do point out in this paper is that technical change is occurring. We now have artificial intelligence, we have computer algorithms and so forth, which mean that many of the traditional tasks of the professions, which are guarded as very important, very exclusive and so on, are becoming undermined. Take something like radiology, an important profession. You know, these are the people who take X-ray photographs and look for spots on them to see whether you've got lung cancer or breast cancer or whatever it may be. It's pretty clear now that artificial intelligence uh, algorithms can do these tasks better than human beings can. The trouble is with, with our regulated occupations that it's, it's difficult to bring in this new technology when you've got a group who's going to lose out significantly and, of course, are going to defend their privileges uh, as long as they possibly can. And there was quite a well-known book, Future of the Professions, that was published a couple of years ago by the um, Suskins. To what extent do you share their view that the monopoly position of the professions is going to be entirely threatened by new technologies? 
I think there is a lot in, in what the Suskins are saying. I think possibly they go over the top at times when they talk, for example, about a, a new commons, a kind of wiki type thing where in the future there won't be professionals because we'll all be, you know, contributing to this uh, in some way. I can see that might happen in some areas, but perhaps not in others. They do put their finger on a lot of technologies which are beginning to undermine the traditional justification for having these special privileges for occupations. There's other stuff coming up as well. I've been interested recently to read what Matt Ridley has been saying about blockchain technologies. It essentially provides an unalterable record of transactions of various kinds. That could be something which could be applied, for example, in conveyancing, moving between between houses and so forth, which at the moment is an expensive business for people. In the future, people could do it for themselves via technology. All these kind of developments, which the Suskins point to, I think, are moving us in the same direction. They're undermining the traditional arguments for occupational exclusivity. I mean, on the medical example, though, yeah. surely there's a strong argument that people would always want to have their symptoms diagnosed by a human, to have that kind of bedside manner, that human experience. I think the human factor is very important, clearly, not just in medicine, but in counselling, in, you know, in advice, careers advice and things like this. Though it's interesting, there is some evidence that in some circumstances, people may actually prefer to talk to an algorithm. If you're talking about very embarrassing situations, whether they be uh, medical problems or, or personal relationships and so on, it's often difficult to talk to a, a human. So people would rather talk about he yeah. hemorrhoids with a robot. Exactly. Than with a yes, wouldn't you? <laughs> yes, I would. <laughs> Bring on the revolution. I mean, obviously, uh, doctors are not going to be replaced from uh, human interaction anytime soon. But uh, I think we may not need as many doctors in the future. I mean, that's another thing. We think about the the problems of the NHS, for example, we haven't got enough doctors, we haven't got enough nurses and so forth. But are we using doctors and nurses as effectively as we might? Are there ways in which machines, robots, artificial intelligence can take on many of the tasks which doctors and nurses have traditionally done? I find it very odd that this issue doesn't feature very prominently on the policy agenda at the moment. We forever hear about the NHS crisis. The government has gone as far as setting up a centrally planned industrial strategy as an attempt to combat the productivity crisis. And yet it seems to be really ignoring how technology might be reshaping the workforce. Well, I, th I think that the, the British government is very, very slow to react to things like this. In the United States, this is a much bigger issue because in the States, of course, you have regulation at three levels. You have federal regulation, you have state regulation, you have local regulation. And it's been conceived as a major problem. When uh, President Obama was in charge, there's a, there a big report written by, for the White House on this, suggesting ways in which it might be reformed. The European Commission has also taken an interest in it. There was a draft directive last year which was intended to cut back on the amount of regulation. Australia has also been concerned about it. New Zealand has been concerned about this. Uh, but in the UK, it hasn't really yet caught on. And in fact, our drift has been very much towards more regulation. Theresa May, when she was Home Secretary, there's a lot of fuss in the press about phone tapping and uh, her, her response to this, because one, one private investigator had been sent to prison as a result of this, was to say that, all right, private investigators are going to have to be regulated. They're going to have to join the security industry regulatory body they're going to have to do examinations, they're going to have to show that they understand the law. In other words, you can't be a private eye anymore uh, without government approval. And I bet the existing <laughs> private eyes loved that new regulation. Oh, they did indeed, yes. The Association of British Investigators welcomed this, uh, but said it didn't go far enough. They wanted more and more rules to protect their particular patch. To, to protect their incumbent status. Yeah. Um, well, you know, we've been through lots of the adverse consequences of overzealous occupational licensing. But, you know, how can you be sure that without this regulation, high standards will be maintained? I mean, second rate services can create problems for third parties. So let's say you have a hugely incompetent solicitor who puts together a, a shoddy will. This is going to create huge problems down the line for the family of the deceased, taking a more laissez-faire view of things. How will that account for all the negative externalities? It's a horses for courses kind of thing. There are, in fact, a number of different types of regulation which you could have. The version I've been criticising here is licensing, where the government says, you've got to do this, this, this and this. You've got to pay as a fee. You've got to do continuing professional development. You've got to have these qualifications, etc., etc. That is full licensing. One alternative is registration, 
where people uh, simply have to show that they're financially viable, that they don't have criminal convictions or something like that, and then they can join a register. You've got some minimal protection there. Another form is certification, where, where the government approves somebody as having a qualification in the area, but it doesn't say this is an exclusive privilege. So this is something useful for people to obtain, but it doesn't exclude people who've got some other skills which they could bring to a particular task. You can also have a private sector approach to this as well of accreditation and the classic case of this in the UK is accountancy. Accountancy is not protected, not uh, occupationally licensed by the government but nevertheless the accountancy bodies have very good reputations and people who achieve these qualifications are in a very strong position in the market and, and people know when they get a, a you know an approved accountant that they're getting yeah. somebody of a high quality but the government's not involved. People I know who are accountants my age in their mid-twenties seem to be constantly revising for an exam or constantly having just yes. finished one exam <laughs> ready for another. But that's, that's something which the market generates. There are bodies like the Association of Accounting Technicians, for example, which can do lower level work, cheaper work, which uh, competes with, at one level, the higher accountancy qualifications. So it's possible that private sector can generate these kind of things without the government being heavily involved in it. Where would you place the state in all of this? Like, is, there, is there any role for government in occupational licensing? I think the, the role for government should be very much smaller than it currently is. One of the surprising things is that we managed until the year 2000 with just under 10% of our workforce in licensed occupations. We now have about 20% in the space of 17, 18 years. Are we any better for that? It, it's not apparent to me that we are. What we've got now is a lot of all graduate professions. We're finding uh, many graduates are in areas which are not traditionally thought of as graduate but now a graduate qualification is required yeah. uh, and yet we find that you know there's still this very hard core of people who can't get into work well, at it, all. It's a horrible um, cycle that feeds it, itself because yeah. the more professions ask for a degree it makes degrees essential to every young ambitious person and so this cycle continues and it propagates itself. That's right and, and of course uh, a degree is for many young people not the best thing to do I mean it's a very expensive time consuming thing and uh, you know it doesn't always lead to very exciting jobs. The trouble is that you know the termites have spread haven't they? So they've, <laughs> they've, they've, um, it's too late to tell young people don't bother getting a degree because now the jobs that 20 years ago wouldn't have required one now do so they mm, actually mm, do mm. need one. Yeah yeah. Well, I, I think there could be a gradual process of, of, of deregulation, but it does need, I think, people to start thinking in these terms. When the Conservatives came into power in 2010, there was all sorts of talk about bonfire of regulations. Bonfire so, you know, of the Krangos. And <laughs> all that kind of stuff. It just hasn't happened. In fact, it's got a lot more regulation in many areas. But this occupational regulation, you see, is something which is rather different from the general regulation to do with, I don't know, maternity leave and issues like discrimination, those kind of things, which apply right across the, uh, the economy. Those are, are common right across Europe. The interesting thing about occupational regulation is it's very Brit-specific. And if we wanted to scrap those kind of things, we could do it. It's nothing to do with the European Union. There are, very, there, there are actually just seven professions which the European Union has rules right across the European Union, and we would presumably have to stick with that for, for the time being. The key medical professions, not all of them, but vets, there's one or two others like this, but the great bulk of occupational licensing is Brit-generated. We've done it to ourselves, and we can unpick it, and I think we should. <laughs> Thank you, Len. For more podcasts, blogs, reports and films, go to our website, iea.org.uk.